friends and welcome back to CS Mentor. In this video, I'm going to be continuing with the schools of thought as I had left in the previous video. So let's just do a quick recap of what we'd studied in the natural school of thought. The natural school thinkers believe that law is anything which is equitable or good or it is whatever is reasonable is the law and a law must be the standard of what is just or unjust. Whatever is just is law, whatever is unjust is not law. As we move to the positivist thinkers, the father of the positivist school, that is John Austin, he believed that law has to be made by the political superior. And he believed that every political superior must give some kind of a command. And this command must be backed by a sanction. And uh, after John Austin, we had studied about Professor H. L. A. Hart, who believed that law should be as it is and must not enshrine the purpose or it must not have even if it does not have any objectives it's fine even if the law is just or unjust doesn't matter as long as the law is made by the political superior it must be as it is then we went ahead to uh, Hans Kelsen who gave the theory known as the pure theory of law he believed that there is something known as a grand norm and this grand norm is the highest authority exist that is existing and then we studied about Jeremy Bentham, who believed that a law mu has eight aspects to it. And in addition to that, a law must bring about some kind of gain to maximum members in society and bring about the least amount of harm to least members in society. Now let's move on to the historical definition of law. The historical definition of law, you have thinkers such as Savigny, okay, whose theory of law is essentially surrounding around the fact that law is found and it is not made. See over here, law is found and not made. What does this mean? They are simply saying that uh, according to the historical school of thought, customs take more precedence than um, the legislature. So I can say uh, custom is greater than the legislation. And unlike the positivist school thinkers who believe that law is only made by a political superior, the historical school thinkers believe that law is found and therefore law is anything which exists when society exists. Okay, And like a language, it varies with people and age. So don't we know customs vary in geographical terms as well as like um, amongst people. People in the North India may have different customs as compared to people in the South of India. In South of India itself, people will have different customs according to their language or their caste or customs or whatever it is. Now, what the historical school uh, thinkers saying that law evolves with society. Okay. And law is not static. The word is the law is not static. That means it is constantly evolving. All right. So when a society emerges, law is created. As the society changes, law will also change to change accordingly. And when the society dies out, even the law will die out. Okay. Now, this, as you can see over here, custom not only precedes legislation, but is superior to it. That is what I said over here. Okay. And law should always conform to the popular consciousness. That means as societies changes, as society's beliefs and needs are changing, even the law must change according to it. This is directly in opposition to the positivist thinkers who believe that law must be as it is, even if it was made 200 years ago or 300 years ago. Doesn't matter. As long as the law was made by the political superior, even if it is unjust, it can still be the law. But the historical school thinkers think otherwise. They believe that as people change, even though law must change with it and legislation is the last stage of law making and, theref and therefore the lawyer or the jurist is more important than the legislator so they're saying that first comes a custom okay and then only comes a legislation so for the purpose of understanding this custom for that you have lawyers or you have judges okay and these people will help to understand the custom better as compared to the um, 
members of parliament i'll call them mps over here as compared to members of parliament it is these judges and lawyers who will be able to better understand the law and therefore they are the more important people as compared to parliamentarians whereas the positive school thinkers believe otherwise they believe that judge made law is not even law and only law made by the political superior is law so therefore we can say that the historical definition of law is the exact opposite of the positive school of thought next we come to the sociological definition of law the sociological definition of law essentially uh, at least the thinkers state that law is essentially and exclusively a social fact what do you mean by this they are saying that the law has a purpose that is a social function and the law must perform the social function so these law this law itself has three essential conditions as you can see over here the first one is that the, the law is only treated as a means of social control so when they say that it it is only to be treated as a means of social control they simply saying that the purpose of law was to bring about some kind of order in society and that is the only purpose and function of the law the second one it is to serve a social purpose that means the law must be brought in to serve the needs of the people it cannot simply exist if it is not going to take care of the needs of the people the third one is that it is coercive in character this means that if it if people do not follow the law then it uh, the law will punish you in addition to that this law is making you do something that you do not want to do take for example income tax the income tax act which governs income tax is coercive in nature it's telling you you have to pay up something known as an income tax to the government so this coercive this um coercive nature is essentially like a forceful nature and therefore the the thinkers in the sociological definition of law believe that law must serve this social function so what are the three essential elements of this definition law is simply a means of social control it must serve a social purpose and it must be coercive in nature the next thinker under the sociological definition is roscoe pound now roscoe pound believes that law is a mixture of different things he believes that law is a mixture of political philosophy economic interests ethical values and in addition to that it's you you also have to add history tra tradition and legal technique so he believes that law is basically just the claims and demands and expectations of civilized society if what do you expect in a civilized society you expect um you expect there to be peace you expect there not to be any danger that to be protected against any harmful elements in society etc now based on these needs and wants of society only a law must function now remember we said that the sociological definition of law is to serve a social purpose and why are we what do you mean by social it is that element that belongs in a society and society consists of whom the people the society as we know as we live in today and law must sim is simply a means to so is to bring about some kind of order in that society and finally you have the realist definition of law now these people do not try to define law rather they try to see the function or the purpose of law okay so you have a person named homes homes states that law is a statement of circumstances in which the public force will be brought to bear upon through courts next person is cardozo a principle or rule of conduct so established so as to justify a prediction with reasonable certainty that it will be enforced in the courts of law if its authority is challenged is a principle or rule of law so what does this realist definition of law look at like i said they look at the function of law let's assume that there are certain members in society okay now these members in society are living peacefully and they expect a certain amount of peace if they are to coexist together but then there is this one person okay who is considered a kleptomaniac means he steals from other people now these four people the remaining people in society do not want this person to continue stealing so where can they go about to ensure that this man stops stealing can they kill him no that's also wrong right rather they have to bring him to justice through the court of law all right 
Now the court of law is over here and these people will approach this court of law. Now for the court of law to justify that this man is uh, has stolen consistently from people in society, they will use the law to bring him to justice. So we can say that law simply has a function and the realist definition of I mean, the realist thinkers do not try to define what law is. Rather, like the sociological thinkers, they are simply stating that law is a means used by the judges, that is the courts of law, to, to regulate human conduct. So here you can see that law is simply serving one purpose, so that there is harmonious cooperation of members in society. All right. So what is, how is the realist definition of law different from the sociological thinkers? The sociological thinkers also believe that law is serving some kind of social function. The realist definition, the realist thinkers also believe that it serves a social function. While the sociological thinkers believe that law must have a coercive nature, the realist thinkers simply believe that law is simply a means to an end. And it is not exactly necessary that a law must have a coercive nature or not. It's really not required. So friends, this marks the end of the schools of thought. We have come across five schools of thought, that is the natural school, positivist, historical, sociological, sociological and realist school. The natural school thinkers and the historical school thinkers can be said to be somewhat the same. While the natural school thinkers believe that whatever is reasonable, whatever is just and moral is what law is, the historical school thinkers believe that law is found and not made. And therefore, as society changes, as a society grows, the law grows with the society. As society changes, law changes with society. And as society dies out, the law will also die out with them. The positivist school thinkers believe that law is the command of a political superior. And only if a political superior makes the law, it is considered to be law. The sociological thinkers also believe that a law must have a coercive nature just like the positivist school. But you can say that the sociological school thinkers and the realist thinkers are somewhat similar. Both of them believe that law must serve some kind of a social purpose. Okay. While the realist thinker, sorry, while the sociological school believes that they must understand the law and what purpose it serves to achieve before it can be recognized as a law, the realist school simply believes that law is a means to an end and judges need a tool in their hands if they are to bring about justice in society and therefore they do not go about trying to define law, rather they simply look at the function of law. Okay, And this is how the realist school is different from the other four schools. While these four people are trying to define what law is, the realist school is tr simply trying to understand the function of law. So friends, the main characteristics of law is and a definition to become to make it a universal definition because we've seen that different schools of thought have different definitions of law that they follow. So what must we understand and follow? The law presupposes a state. So what it, who is a state? The state is simply no one other than the government. Now, the government consists of whom? It consists of the legislature, the judiciary and the executive. But where does this legislature, judiciary and executive get their power from? They get their power from the constitution of India. And the constitution of India can be considered as what? It can be considered a law in, by itself. And therefore, we can say that the constitution presupposes a state. That means even the judiciary or the legislature or the executive is not above the constitution. And everybody is bound by the principles of the constitution. The second one is that the state makes or authorizes to make or recognizes or sanctions rules which are called law. Now, the constitution over here allows the legislature, judiciary and executive, primarily the legislature, to make laws. And these laws are basically just certain rules which are which has an element of sanction to it. That is a, an, an element of uh, punishment to it. And for the rules to be effective, there are sanctions be behind them. In the sense that if um, a law simply exists and there's no one there to enforce them, then nothing will be done about it. 
if you have to take an example there was uh, the the prevention of money laundering act okay prevention of i'll call it the plma pmla sorry this law was in existence for quite some time but there was no way to execute the law so it was considered to be like a dead law all right now this law simply it stated that money laundering is not allowed but then because there was no one to enforce it black money and money laundering continued continued to exist in our country so that's why they're saying that for rules to be effective there must be sanctions behind them the third one these rules called laws have to serve, serve some purpose now this purpose may be a social purpose or it may simply serve some personal ends of the despot so here this is a very positivist definition as well as a sociological definition because the sociological definition says that the perp- the law must have a social purpose but then a law can also serve the needs of some specific people which is a very positivist definition of law laws can be mandatory prohibitive or even permissive in nature what do you mean by mandatory mandatory laws you can say are your income tax act because it is compulsory to pay income tax if you fall under the income tax laws prohibitive law is your criminal procedure code your indian penal code which is essentially saying that if you do something then we will punish you so essentially it's saying that you're not allowed to do certain things such as you're not allowed to steal you're not allowed to commit murder you're not allowed to forge uh, documents etc and lastly you have permissive permissive statutes or permissive laws take for example your companies act of 2013 your companies act is permitting you to carry to start a company and carry it forward as long as it follows the rules laid down in the companies act of 2013 so these are the three types of laws which you can say exists in our country now how are laws made effective the first one is by requiring some damages to be paid damages to be paid for an injury due to disobedience what do you mean by damages the answer is simply known as monetary compensation so the court will essentially say that if some kind of injury has been caused then we will grant monetary compensation to whom to the victim so this is one way in which a law is made effective if a person goes ahead and commits a crime against another person is it simply enough that the wrongdoer is punished if there's a victim also right they were harmed in the process so that victim will be given some kind of monetary compensation the second type of um, thing which can be used to make laws effective are by requiring in some instances to complete an obligation he has failed to perform now for this i, I will take the example of your contract act Let's assume that there is a person A and he wants to buy something from person B. B in turn agrees to supply it to person A. So let's say it is cement. Now why does A want to buy cement so that he can build a house? All right? And B tells A, "See buddy, it will take some time to procure the cement, so we will I will procure the cement and give it to you in installments over the next 3 months." so a um, considers that and he agrees to that now based on b's conviction that yes the cement will be supplied to a over the next 3 months a goes ahead and starts buying all the other things he starts buying tiles he starts buying um, nails or he, he starts buying um, he starts planning it out for the house he even like appoints an architect he does all of these things and in 1 and 1/2 months or 2 months b does not perform his end of the contract now a has already gone ahead and bought these things which he would not have done had b not given his word stating that he will provide the cement so in this case is it simply enough that b gets punished no right it the court sees more sense in making b pay up his obligation that means b simply cannot escape his obligation and say that okay i will pay a fine it doesn't work that way the court will require b to compulsorily provide the cement to a so that he can complete building his house the next way in which laws are made effective is simply by preventing disobedience so these are your uh, you can even call it your preventive detention laws so what if a person is trying to commit some kind of terrorist activity against the general public 
is it enough that we punish him after he has committed this terrorist activity no right it is better to prevent him from ever committing that activity so that the public can remain safe so these are known as your preventive detention laws and finally you have the fourth manner on which laws are made effective is simply by administering some form of punishment what is this form of punishment it can be a fine or it can even be imprisonment so essentially these are the four ways in which laws are made effective so friends let's go through a quick round up of the entire chapter what is law law is not static and it changes as society changes but laws are also changed to fit the requirements of society what is the purpose of law it is to bring about some kind of security for the future and it serves as a vehicle for a vehicle for social change and the harbinger of social justice so that means law, laws are brought in so as to bring about a, a better society now we we tried studying about what is the definition of law using five schools of thought that is the natural positivist historical sociological and def, and realist schools of thoughts after that we we try to understand what are the sources of indian law or at least modern indian law all right so you have two sources you have the principal so the primary sources and you have the secondary sources your secondary sources are only applicable when and if the primary sources do not exist so what are the primary sources of indian law you have statutes and legislation you have judicial decisions or precedents you have customs or customary law and finally you have personal laws the secondary sources of indian law the first one is justice equity and good conscience this is just the common sense used by the judge in case the primary sources are not ap- are not available and then because india fashions its laws after the britishers or how the britishers had implemented law in our country we can even refer to british law or otherwise known as english law in case there are no primary sources of indian law so where can we find this english law there is something known as common law which is basically just a combination of different customs of different uh, judicial pronouncements textbooks or even existing laws then we have the law of merchant which um i'll also call as mercantile law which is a combination of customs and trade usages as well as existing laws relating to traders or merchants and then you have the principle of equity which is basically a principle whereby you can go on appeal to some person other than the king who will enforce justice by not looking at the rigid principles of law so that means this person will also follow the principles of justice equity and good conscience all right this is known as the principle of equity under this we study two principles he who comes to equity must do equity and he who comes to equity must come with clean hands and finally we have statute law then we studied about merchant law itself which is mercantile law which is basically the uh, legal principles governing all business transactions and the main sources of mercantile law are english mercantile law that is the law as was followed by the britishers laws which are formed by the indian legislature uh, after receiving some element of independence from the britishers judicial decisions customs and trade usages finally what is jurisprudence jurist simply means law and prudence simply means knowledge so jurisprudence is merely the study and science of law so friends that's all for this video and for this chapter i hope you found these videos to be informative and interesting if you have any doubts or if you have any queries do leave your comments below in the comment section and uh, more importantly don't forget to subscribe before you leave Thank you.